The Unshackled Waves, Episode 30. Hello and welcome to the Unshackled Waves podcast. I'm Tim Williams, here for another interview show for this week. Our guests for today are Australian libertarian YouTubers, The Rational Right, who are made up of James Fox Higgins, uh, Rob McMullen, and Sam Lowe. Of course, Sven. Yeah. <laughs> I knew I'd mess that up. All good. I've been getting all my life here in Australia, so... So they make videos about political philosophy, current events, and reviews about uh, popular culture. They're a growing YouTube channel. All of their videos are very well professionally done. So guys, welcome to the show. Thanks for having us, Tim. Thanks. Thank you. So I'll start from the beginning. So it's clear that you guys uh, were good friends for quite a while before beginning your channel. So what led to its creation? Uh, yeah, like... James and Rob were good friends before we started the channel, but I I met them quite a while after that, um, and only about six months ago. We all happened to be um, callers on um, the Free Domain Radio uh, show, and yeah, we sort of managed to get in touch with each other, and it was just <laughs> such a, um, like, what are the odds that we all live so close to each other, and we decided to start the YouTube channel just because it was the conversations we were having anyway, so... That's, that's how it sort of happened. And so how did you come to your present libertarian beliefs? Was there a certain event where you, you had an awakening? Um, I think it's probably a little different for each of us, but um, I know that for me, um, I've tried to be sort of politically aware my, my whole life, and I've always felt a real frustration with, um, with government and feeling like it's a sort of a beast that can never be tamed. And I've kind of swung in my younger years between extremes of, you know, sort of thinking that, you know, communism is, is a great ideal to move towards. And But for me, at the, at the root of it, there's always been this um, distrust in the way things are. And, uh, and it all came together for me when, when Rob uh, gave me a book by Stefan Molyneux called Everyday Anarchy. Uh, and that really laid out some of the fundamentals, including the non-aggression principle and, and things like that. Um, so once I'd kind of read that book, it was sort of, you know, my, my first red pill, as they say. And uh, and it's been a continuous study for the last two years since then. Um, Rob was a, about a year or so ahead of me. Um, what, what was it that sort of uh, got you first awake? Um, I started trolling YouTube for a lot of the men's rights stuff. And obviously, if you hit YouTube and looking, you know, a lot of people talking about men's rights, so like the anti-feminism kind of thing, it's a very libertarian kind of perspective. But probably the first video that opened a gate in my mind was one by Stefan Molyneux again, which was called Myths of the World Wars. And in this, he made the case that World War II was about fighting socialism, yet so many decades later, we are objectively less free, 70 million people dead, and we are less free than before that war. And I thought, well, that's actually a very good point. And it started me thinking about what the whole point of it all is, you know, and that just went from there. You know, that was just a really intriguing perspective I'd never heard before, saying, you know, 100 years ago, there was no income tax, there was no uh, passports, all these sort of things. You know, we were objectively more free 100 years ago, yet millions of people have died in pursuit of freedom for a complete failure. Mm. And and you, you've sort of been uh, at this game uh, longer than either of us. What was it for you? Well, I think even since being a teenager, I've always had a mistrust of authority and the establishment, but it wasn't until, you know, again, thanks, thanks to Steph, and that was close to 10 years ago now that I discovered him, and he really gave, put into words what I always had sort of an emotional... Uh, understanding of, I guess. So, yeah. I guess the short answer then is Stefan Molyneux. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, it's interesting. People 
uh, come to the movement from diff uh, different people. But uh, yes, yeah, so, so sort of you've come through uh, sort of a lot of libertarians say they read a read a book or uh, saw, uh, saw a, a global event happen. But if you you guys found libertarianism sort of the, the new way through the internet. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also we share, oh, so someone with like Steph, we share that kind of artistic element, you know, like uh, not an econ thing, but he's sort of a very um, artistically leaning person as well. Like with I mean, acting and singing, you know, like me and James are both professional musicians, Ben's um, done some work in music as well. So we kind of sh maybe share a bit of a, you know, common interest and personality similarity with the creative side, the more artistic philosophical side rather less than academic. Really less, ac less ac academic, um, yeah. economic kind of way of coming to the arguments as well, yeah. cool. which we really appreciate now, but there's an initial gate, you know, more in an abstract kind of philosophical way. Yeah, and I guess that's the thing is to get that first um, awakening to a whole, a radically different philosophy than what you're coming from, everyone's going to have a different approach that will really call to them. Uh, so it's sort of no surprise that, um, you know, all three of us have come to these views via Stefan Molyneux because we are all good mates. We have a lot of, uh, a lot of common ground outside of philosophy and, and libertarianism. Um, Sven and I are both huge science fiction fans. Rob and I are both musicians together. There's heaps of, heaps of life parallels. So yeah, it sort of makes sense that we've all found our way here the same way. Yeah. Uh, we'll move on to talking about your your channel now. So uh, you've been going at it uh, at it for about six or so months now, is it? Yep, probably. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So are you pleased with the the growth of your channel, and have you found the reception to it? Are we pleased, Rob? Yeah, it's good. It's good. Um, they, these things do have exponential growth. You know, it sat at at fifty subscribers, hundred subscribers for a while, and then. You know, it just took off, you know, after that. A little bit of controversy helps. A little bit too. of controversy <laughs> helps, you know, like we've, I'd have to say overwhelmingly positive, like when people in the libertarian scene, very positive. Um, and, you know, I guess what we wanted to do is provide, you know, a different voice, a different um, character to the same sort of ideas, and, and we've had good reception with that. With, say, normies, <laughs> You know, that's been a mixed bag of reception, um, some some bad, but even probably more supportive. And, you know, we've been able to make a lot of ground with people who, you know, haven't gone all the way, but are like, yeah, you know what, I really like what you guys are doing and something about it is, is pretty cool. Maybe they respect that we're doing it even if they don't agree with all of them. True. Yeah. Yep. Uh, because yeah, having a YouTube channel or a, we a website, you've you've got to take uh, uh, some uh, public public criticism. So it's certainly not for the the faint-hearted. True. No, we've been finding that out. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, what is your ultimate goal with the uh, the channel? Like, what would you what would you ult uh, ultimately like to achieve, or what sort of uh, growth are you after? Well, I'd like to um, get to a point where we're, um, you know, respected in the broader um, libertarian and philosophical scene where, you know, we're, we're among the, uh, the names that spring to mind when people um, are thinking about how to red pill their friends, you know. Um, I'd like for people to go, oh, you've got to see this video from the rational right. That'll really um, communicate to you in ways that, you know, others can't. So I guess in that way, we're, we're still finding our way and feeling our way with it, but we want to try to bring a unique perspective to this whole realm of conversation and, uh, and we'd like it to be impactful to the masses, ultimately. Also, too, like I, I, a big feeling for me dobbing into the whole libertarian and philosophy thing for the last couple of years has just been like, oh, my God, I've just never heard this. And then when you get enough of these arguments that just make so much sense and they can be backed up right from the basic principles, you start looking at society like just competing systems of insanity, <laughs> you know, unfortunately. And so for me, like I've always had a pretty logical brain and a creative brain. Um, I feel like my inherent personality has not changed going to these ideas. I think I've landed in them because of who I am. 
uh, in a lot of ways, but just this feeling that like, oh, I wish I'd have heard that. Mm -hmm. You know, I wish I'd have heard this in school. I wish this had just been something that people could talk about. And um, just makes so much sense. And so for me, like, uh, love it if it the point got you know got to the point where people were, like James said were sharing our videos or that we were asked to you know make a comment on you know um, on TV or in papers or things like that to actually say well here look here's a, here's a solution from principle you know yeah. instead of just this arbitrary madness that people fling backwards and forwards and you know for me being fueled by that I wish I knew this stuff earlier that I would like to give this to people earlier you know and give this to other people and just bring um, sort of clear thinking and, and, and principles and um, I think an ideology that is so outside the mainstream because it makes so much sense, you know, I want to bring that to people as well. Mm. A, lot of your, a lot of your videos are of a more educational nature. There's a lot of uh, libertarian or cultural libertarianist YouTubers who tend to, the most popular form of YouTube video these days is sort of the anti-SJW one, but you uh, mainly stick to, you know, educating people uh, about liberty and sort of this is, uh, 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 being in the libertarian movement for quite a number of years, it's always a topic of debate. Uh, how do you think is the best method for communicating liberty to a wider audience? Um. Well, firstly, we've got to have the humility to say, like, we don't know what the best way is, so we don't really know what we're doing, but we're just trying to do everything at once. And I think that's the beauty of, of the internet is there's there's room for you to have your channel, there's room for all the other channels, and, you know, it's a marketplace of ideas, and whoever's got the most compelling content, that's the stuff that's going to rise to the top. So on the one hand, that's the answer to, you know, getting the knowledge out there, but, you know, coming back even further, I think... Some people just aren't prepared to, they're not equipped to understand the ideas and then you've got to come back to something like, you know, peaceful parenting for a peaceful world and so that people grow up, you know, with a rational mind so that they can actually process the sort of stuff we're talking about. So, yeah, it's definitely, definitely challenging. Would you say, like, mm -hmm. even if um, people are not going to be able to absorb ideas of liberty rationally or academically, they'll be able to absorb them emotionally? Mm -hmm. to a peaceful parenting model? Well, I, I just think talking about like libertarianism to people that have been traumatized, you know, mm -hmm. and they haven't even got their own lives, their own personal lives sorted out, let alone, you know, how can they fix the problems of the world on these big scales? So I, I think, though, there is a, a very clear pathway for people that are traumatized. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't want to go into too much, but I didn't have it very well as a child. Mm -hmm. And I think that does set up a distaste, um, you know, an emotional sort of distrust of authority, of arbitrary authority as well. That I think is a pathway. It certainly has been for me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think, um, you know, childhood trauma um, would necessarily exclude you from being able to um, absorb this stuff and, and really uh, have a philosophical shift in your view. But, um, but I guess for um, as far as getting the message to the maximum number of people and having the most impact on the world, because ultimately we're all humanitarians here. We're all trying to um, uh, promote the philosophy that we see is demonstrably better for the human race, for everyone, um, you know, at least in principle, in philosophical principle. And um, for people to experience from their early childhood um, to experience parents who practice the non-aggression principle at home is uh, is the, the best way to get through to the most number of people. I think that's sure. sort of what you're getting mm -hmm. at. Yeah, it's that idea of the, the society we live in is a shadow cast by family relationships, you know. So. Mm -hmm. well, I think it's that, very true. That said, as far as communicating these ideas on, on the interwebs and, and doing the kind of work we're doing, um, there's, you know, uh, there's many different ways to go. And uh, I don't think it's a silver bullet approach. No, no, that's right. And, and we, we've actually just been talking tonight before this about um, delving into satire a little bit just for our own fun and to see, to see how it's received. So um, I, don't, I don't rule that out for the rational right. We, we may get a bit silly in the future. <laughs> but then again, we also reciprocally want to go more theoretical and more core principle more educational as well. I mean, maybe we'll just try both and yeah. see which one suits our personalities, you know? Well, you know, we're all laissez-faire capitalists, so we want to basically see what the demand is, you know, test the market, see what people respond to, what they want, and then give them what they want. Um, that's that's the ultimate way to go, I think. 
Yeah, I've sort of come to the conclusion over many years that sort of people aren't going to be receptive to the message of liberty unless there's there's some sort of crisis which libertarians can can say we here we have the solution to, or unless they're shown that you know they're being disadvantaged by by the status quo. So I think really you you have to put people in the mood to sort of want to listen. Mm. Well, you know, play to their self interest. Mm. I, I think that that is true and purely just because I think when people go through a crisis, it, it shakes up their belief system. It just mm. sort of puts a, a glitch in the matrix for a period of time. And they're ready to hear. Somebody. And to hear something new, you know, I mean. And that's when we show up with the blue and red pill. And yeah, but I mean, <laughs> but so do the Jehovah's Witnesses. Everyone's vying for uh, supremacy of, of their yeah. philosophy. And, you know, um, I, I hope we can continue to live in a in a civilization where the best argument wins you know at, at, mm. at the moment we're riding on the optimistic hope that people are responsive to um, reason and evidence and arguments I, I think most people they're, they're they're of the opinion because they're they're not engaged in politics on a on a daily basis that things aren't that bad uh, as they see it mm. so they sort of they're they're not sort of looking for a solution like like we are. Mm. And then we come across as pretty radical to them if they're mm. if they're feeling comfortable. Uh, we're here to shake things up, and of course, the people who hate the idea of liberty the most are the people who fear that they will fail in the free market. Um, Which so, leads me to another point: is I think it's also very important. I've been thinking about this as well. People who like because we are biological beings, and a lot of this I really see is a, a, a play between abstract universal philosophy, abstract universal principles and biological self-interest, you know, and, and a lot of people are biological self-interest machines masquerading under a guise of, you know, uh, um, of pseudo-philosophy, mm. you know. So I think if you have something that uh, supersedes biology, it's very hard to fight that biological self-interest. And so really, if you want to what I think would be handy is realizing that people whose biological uh, self-interest or their sexual market value is elevated artificially in the current system, they are never going to entertain an idea that that system is corrupt according to abstract philosophical principles. Mm. Suicide. No, <laughs> they, they won't. They, they just won't. Yeah. Try telling a politician on 400 grand a year or whatever, you know, 200 grand a year that, hey, sorry, you know, this this income that's boosted your your biological um, ability to reproduce um, is corrupt, and you should fight against that. They're just never going to. Uh, Ninety nine point nine repeater percent of people are just never going to do that. Mm. So, with that knowledge, then if that theory is correct, at least you can tailor the image. Uh, sorry, that the the, um, the message to the people who are actually suffering a consequence under uh, under the current system you know someone who would actually be better off um biologically in a free market or under a libertarian system and but they've been kind of brainwashed to go well i, I may be giving up 30 40 percent of my taxable income but that's just the way it is mm. but if you can come and i've had that feedback too you come to someone and say well actually you know that there's not necessarily i mean you have to think very carefully about this idea that you can be exploited like that, you know? How far can you back up this idea that the current system is legitimate and have that conversation with them? Because at least they're going to have an incentive to think about changing it because they are actually being taxed under the current system where some other people are being subsidized. Uh, certainly there's there's going to be a few people which you're never going to convince and sort of, so they're not worth your time, but there there is a lot of people who are, uh, you know, uh, not engaged, who are definitely uh, up for uh, uh, being red pilled. That, that sort of phrase is quite yeah. new to me for red, red pilling people, but it's slowly working its way into my uh, vocabulary. But certainly, where, where were you in the nineties when the Matrix came out? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've I've seen the Matrix, but I just uh, it, it never entered my lexicon. Red pilling people. Now let's focus on some of the videos that are featured on your channel. A video series that you've started doing, uh, they're called Car Rants, where you uh, film and talk about philosophy uh, while you're driving. Um, I, I'm just curious, why do you film this way and isn't it a bit dangerous? 
Um, I don't see it as dangerous if you set it up when you're not driving. You know, <laughs> you, to try and get that happening while you're driving would be very dangerous. Oh, but so once you're, you're going, driving. hit record before you put it in gear. Yeah. No, 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 we, no, no, it's we driving, just, but like we just you, hit record before we put you, it in you here. You place it there and it's just sort of sitting on your screen like a Tom Tom, you know, like it's so it's sitting on your windscreen like a Tom Tom. Yeah, yeah. It's not, you know, it's not, um, it's like a hands free conversation with, yeah, but yourself. I mean, the whole time you're actually just looking forward and like driving as usual, like you're talking to someone in the passenger seat. So yeah. I'm not sure that it's dangerous, but I mean, if they wanted to say, it's dangerous. Well, how would it be more dangerous than having a GPS? Our ideas are dangerous. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> I, I guess I ask it because yeah. it's not something that I feel that I could do. Like, because uh, it takes a lot of my energy to to make make a recording, and if I was recording while driving, that would that, that would be too much, in my opinion. But uh, you guys yeah, seem sure. to make it work. We're pretty good at ranting in any yeah, situation. <laughs> to be honest, it was really just a process of once the record's going on, just opening my mouth and yeah. letting my brain, <laughs> you know, expel what's already going on, kind of thing. You know, like I've been, I've been thinking about starting a new series called Underwater Rants and just, you know, see if any good content can come out. Of, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> underwater <laughs> rants. Yeah. Uh, you can put a little the recorder in a scuba suit. Maybe bungee jumping yeah. rants. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. Extreme, extreme, short. extreme philosophy. Tax <laughs> <laughs> Hey, it's, it's a synced. Yeah. But yeah, but it, a lot of those two, like, I mean, James and I just have so much time driving, you know, as musicians we're driving around the country to different gigs. Um, it's just so much, there's, there's so much time there we could exploit. So it was really an efficiency thing and going, well, here's this wasted time. And I, my brain's just always going like that anyway, so I'm either listening to people talk like that or I'm thinking, having those conversations in my head anyway. So it's really, once record's on, it's like I said, it's just the process of just letting my mouth, you know, express what's sort of going on in my brain anyway. So, yeah, it's, um, and once you get into the zone of just um, having a train of thought and, and going through a couple of different things and trying to try it up at the end, you know, I think yeah, it's something... Yeah. That's, you can that's another effect. thing. We, we, we revere all these people who are communicators of ideas, but none of us are actually trained as public speakers or anything like that. So mm. I mean, that's another reason we set up the channel to begin with is just to force ourselves to start creating content like yeah. this and to hone our own ability at communication. So what better way to do that than while yep. we're driving? There's also a lot of barriers for entry, um, even within ourselves. Like, you know, we hesitate because we just, like, I know for me I'm a perfectionist about a lot of things that I do. Um, so, you know, we put a lot of uh, time and effort into, you know, building a, a room here to do these videos in. Um, but prior to that, you know, there was hesitancy in me to do it if it didn't have good production value. But um, we just sort of, the three of us work well together because we just um, remind each other, look, forget the excuses, let's just do something. Let's just mm -hmm. say our piece, let's just get our ideas out there. Um, it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, it doesn't have to be high quality. It just has to be um, communicable, you know, and um, if people can hear what we're saying, then it's good enough. So I guess the car rants, um, we don't do them that much anymore, but I'm sure that we will when we need to, when we get the itch and we're on our way to a gig or, or work or whatever, we'll, we'll do one. Um, but it's really just a way to say, look, what, what we're saying is more important than how we're saying it or, or the context in which we're saying it. So, yeah, it's just a no-excuses kind of approach. Yeah, it's certainly a unique, uh, a unique way of, uh, of doing videos. So certainly uh, if... If if your channel becomes uh, becomes more widely known, people will, will will know. Oh, they're the guys that that do the car rant. So it could be your your trademark. Well, maybe we just need to up the ante on that and do yeah, like maybe. carpool karaoke maybe. style. Hopefully, they don't you know like don't listen <laughs> and the cops uh, start trailing it. Like, I'm sure they could come up with something like, oh, you could look at a GPS while you're driving, but you can't talk with a phone recorder. Well, we just we just install, um, you know, security systems instead of GoPros in the car. And, <laughs> then it's legal. Ha, ha, has anything interesting happened while you've done a car rant? Like, there's been uh, a tra uh, There's been absolutely no incidents whatsoever. No. No. Look, you know, one time I had to drive... Oh. Oh three or four hours inland and it's just a big straight road like there's you know you to get a 15 minute rant on you it's there's nothing happening it's not like you you know 
traversing some mountainous range, you know, or driving through through a city, you just it's a big straight road, you know. So it's not no, there's no, been no incident at all. Now let's uh, turn back to talking about uh, libertarianism. So there seems to be this sharp divide that's emerged in the libertarian movement between, uh, I suppose they're called the left libertarians and, as I mentioned before, the anti-social justice warrior types. Uh, what's your take on this divide and sort of its effect on the, the wider movement? Well, I think... Uh... I'm not really sure what left libertarian means, but there's um, there's certainly different camps in, in the li libertarian scene, and, and a lot of infighting um, on ideas, and um, you know, obviously, some people um, in the libertarian camp are more effective than others, and some of them are more principled than others. Um, I think um, if your main goal is to destroy leftists or destroy SJWs, then, um, then maybe you need to go back to the drawing board and look at the principles a bit more. Um, that said, uh, like we said before, there's, there's, there's no silver bullet approach to getting these ideas out there. And there are a lot of, a lot of significant problems with the SJW mindset and, and uh, their approach to politics. And they do need to be criticised. They do need to be ridiculed. Um, and some people are more talented at ridiculing their opponent than making a, a rational case for their own position. So I say, uh, if that's your thing, go for it, but it's not going to be everyone's thing. So I think uh, the best approach to um, spreading the ideas of libertarianism are to find your thing and uh, do it uh, to the best of your ability and uh, work alongside the people who are doing it a different way. I guess I would uh classify a left libertarian as, say, a libertarian who believes in uh, feminism, the ideas of, like, privilege, uh, obviously, uh, queer liberation. Do you, do you think that there's a room for, like, do you think, would you welcome somebody like that in the libertarian movement? Look, if, uh, if a libertarian can make a case for me that third wave feminism uh, is not a massive breach of the non-aggression principle in practice, and if they can argue that and prove it to me, then I'd say, yeah, absolutely, there's a place for that. But um, demonstrably, we don't need to get into it now, but there are plenty of solid arguments made in the statistics and in, and in uh, the empirical reality that third wave feminism is, um, is in breach of the non-aggression principle. So for us, we just always try to come back to um, the principles and where these ideas are stepping away from them, they're stepping away from the core values of libertarianism. So, um, yeah, I mean, as, as for, you know, queer liberation and, and things like that, to me, again, it's, it comes down to the core tenet of, the non, of, uh, of libertarianism is the non-aggression principle, and it is about individualism and, and equal freedom for everyone. And um, anything that is using the violence of the state to uh, inhibit or um, oppress any group or individual is, uh, is non-libertarian as far as I see it. So you think as long as we, as long as a libertarian can bring it back to that core philosophy, then we can have whatever personal beliefs that we want. Yeah, absolutely. Including, including religious ones or, you know, sexual preferences, all of that's irrelevant unless somebody has got a gun and is telling you what you can or can't do. Mm. The reason I ask that question is because it's a common uh, criticism of libertarians that they tend to uh, spend more time fighting amongst themselves uh, r rather than actually mm. trying, to, trying to spread the message of liberty. Yeah, that's very true. But I think there is an element. Um, leftists have an uncanny ability to co-opt terms. <laughs> um, it's one of their main It's, main their, it's their main shtick, really. Yeah. yeah. And so, like, to a leftist, other people owning property and trading that property in voluntary transactions that has nothing to do with them is a breach of their freedom. Mm -hmm. So if you have a movement saying, well, we're for freedom, a lot of leftists are going to be like, well, I have to work for a living, therefore I'm not free, therefore this movement must be for me. And then they go in there and, and turn it to shit. <laughs> you know, to put a technical term on it. And so uh, once again, you know, like if, 
we are open to arguments and I mean that's primarily what we ever uh, you know always wanted to be is just open to arguments and talking about things logically um, if they can bring it back to the principles I mean that'd be interesting to hear about for me but I'd be highly skeptical of something like feminism because I do not have any I can't think of any examples right now where feminism is not about running to the government to equalize um, naturally occurring um, average discrepancies that will that will happen in a state of freedom. I don't. I'm not aware of feminism in this day and age that is not that. Yeah, except maybe in you know the Islamic world or something where you know they. Could oh use yeah, yeah. That, I'm talking about. Here, yeah, here, yeah, here in the West, um, feminism did its job 40 years ago. And now it's tipping the other way and it's become its own violent, hysterical mm. regime. Mm. Um, and, yeah, it just does not uh, – I have not heard any evidence or any arguments made that convince me that it, it has a place in libertarianism. No. And also, I mean, on the gay liberation, I'm not even really sure what that means. Um, well, if, means I mean, I've of, never in my life – Oh, it means yeah. sort of like supporting things such as safe schools, uh, that sort of thing. Is what? Sorry, faith S schools. Safe, 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 safe schools. Is that? Yeah. Is that? That's What's like that? that's state education on um, like transgenderism yeah. and the, and all of that sort of stuff, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I I've got kids and Sven has a, a daughter, and you know we're we're all uh, planning to not put our kids into state schools, um, and. I just think so much of, like, even beyond safe schools, so much of what happens in state schools that uh, that I, I certainly experienced there as a, as a kid is, is uh, uh, you know, government-sanctioned indoctrination mm. for ideas that are, you know, at the time politically correct. And uh, it's always going to be that way in a state school. And if the government is in charge of the way schools and education are run, it's always going to be PC camps. Um, so for me, I just choose to opt out completely of that system. But uh, as far as what I think, you know, are small improvements that could be made to the system, yeah, I think matters of um, religion, spirituality, and sexuality should be dealt with at home. They should have no place whatsoever in in the school. Yeah, I mean, obviously, from the libertarian perspective, like you can want something done, which is people to be educated and tolerant of gay people. But that does not mean in any sense of the word that you think the government's going to do a good job of doing that. Mm. So if I said, well, I don't think that, you know, I agree with you that sexuality and things like that should not be part of a public school curriculum, that's because I think the government is inherently going to ask up anything it does because it's such an in, it's a reversal of incentives. Um, having said that, um, I have a couple of close friends that are gay and I've never had a homophobic bone in my body. So if by gay liberation you mean that people are okay with gay people, um, yeah, of course. If gay, gay people are not, you know, uh, violating the NAP, so there's nothing that can be said where I would ever support any kind of legislative action against them. Um, that being said as well, though, um, they are a minority in compared to the heterosexual population, so I don't know if there's ever going to be like a social prevalence, like most people are not gay. And so in, in the case where they want to um, consume cultural products or art or things or movies, uh, you, it, there's always going to be like majority heterosexual representation just because that's the population. Yeah, yeah. And that's not oppression of gay people. If it ever was oppression of gay people, I wouldn't support it. But in the same way, I think that... Um, there, once again, there's this sort of Marxist thing that liberation means, well, a minority should be not treated like a minority or, or that everyone should support them or whatever. Yeah, and treat treat this, every group. Yeah, the, uh, it's sort of liberation. It's sort of it's become a word from the left that it means the minority gets to tell the majority uh, how, how to live in their, exactly. their, their, and their sort of you know, lifestyle or worldview is, is wrong and hateful. And that applies exactly. to all minorities except libertarians. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. We don't we don't get to uh, no. We don't get to dominate, you know, because no. we don't want to. Whether uh, yeah. So I mean, in the <laughs> same way, like if there was a government program that was um, pushing, you know, um, in a, in a way that's un unrepresentative of the population percentages, you know, pushing sort of um, 
um, or overrepresenting like a gay gay lifestyle or anything. It's like I don't well I don't trust trust the government. If something happened like that organically in the culture as a result of voluntary choices of people, I'd be fine with it. But that that would, said, it is happening in the culture. Like you look at Hollywood, um, and there is yeah. a, a massive overrepresentation. You know, just again, like Rob's saying, you know, just looking at the statistical numbers of uh, homosexuals or LGBT um, people, there's been a pretty consistent percentage of the population in the West over a long, long period of time. But now we do have this um, overrepresentation in, in popular culture, and I don't think that's a result of government intervention or or um, coercion, but um, there is, um, you know, underlying, like, politics is downstream of culture, right? So the things that are shaping the governments to be more leftist in the West are a result of cultural Marxism, which, of mm -hmm. course, has an effect on pop culture and, and other avenues. So um, it's something to be aware of, mm -hmm. um, but it's a sort of different battle than, than the one against um, yeah. big government. But once again, you can simplify it down to whatever happens as a result of the voluntary interactions of people who abide by their own aggression principle, I'm fine with. Yeah. Uh, the reason why I don't think much of left libertarianism is because it's it, it's what the, the media and sort of the cultural elites uh, believe in, which is not what the masses of people, like the vast majority of people don't have time for uh, pol a political correctness or identity politics. And so I think it's better to try and reach them than rather try and get, say, the people at BuzzFeed to like you. Yeah, oh, I agree. They will never like you because at the end of the day, the people at BuzzFeed, um, they I I would educatingly guess, um, I would guess that they're so leftist that they're going to say it when you know, when the rubber hits the road. If you're not paying taxes for other people's benefit, then you're being oppressive. And I don't think that hurdle is ever we're ever going to get over that hurdle with people who are left leaning. And sort of uh, uh, the event of the past year that sort of uh, made the divide within the libertarian movement uh, more prevalent is uh, the, the, the campaign and then the election of, of Donald Trump. There were uh, some libertarians who were part of the, the Trump is Hitler crowd and then there was other libertarians who were uh, wearing their Make America Great Again caps uh, pr uh, proudly. Uh, now, uh, based on your videos, you're somewhat supportive of uh, Trump's, Trump's campaign as, as was I. So what do you sort of see? Is there a libertarian case for Trump? 100%. 100%. There's a few points to make, but probably the most prevalent one, and even just saying um, his his rule that um, for every regulations. every regulation that comes into have to be scrapped. Mm. That's the most libertarian thing I've ever heard <laughs> from, <laughs> from, as from as anyone. As so as a practical, in far, in far, as far as anyone in a, power, a situation of power doing anything yeah. with any real world effects, like I mean, that is it's more libertarian than anything Gary Johnson was putting exactly. As far I mean, as actually shrinking the state. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Gary Johnson was uh, terrible. I mean, he's he, uh, he started off his campaign by saying, you know, Donald Trump was a racist for wanting to build the wall, and then there was that terrible interview where he was triggered by the term illegal immigration, and it was just a disaster. Uh, and, then, look, and, then, and then what is Aleppo, just to yeah, put the, the, yeah. the final bullet in the horse? But here we get back to that thing of me saying, well, you know what, leftists co-op terms. It would not surprise yeah. me if that, you know, if that guy is funded by George Soros or something, you know, and he's just in there to make libertarians look like idiots because that's exactly what he did. Yeah. I could run as a libertarian candidate way better than Gary Johnson. The guy's an idiot, <laughs> a complete idiot, and but, it's uh, just... Maybe that uh, stripper at the Libertarian Convention would have made a better presidential candidate. Yeah, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure. But, I mean, with the Trump thing, look, you know, on, on the one hand, um, you've got Trump versus Hillary. Hillary is funded by Saudi Arabia and they've had ties to the UN and things like that. So, I mean, a lot of these um, very totalitarian states are, are working very closely with all of these globalist, um, globalist organizations like the UN and things like that and pushing out um, less totalitarian states as well. So for them to be... I know loudly and proudly, you know, Big government, global yeah, government, yeah. And, know, I mean, she was also, you know, they had the George Soros ties. He's a he's a complete globalist. So, you know, on the one hand, for me, like Trump 
is a nationalist and and Hillary was very much a globalist in the same tradition that you know George Bush and uh, and Barack Obama just this a continuation of this entrenched elite globalist um, system and if your goal is small government a national government is smaller than a globalist one therefore if you only have two choices the choice should be quite clear but I mean second to that you know Trump actually has some um, economic understanding and as well and with the bringing the regulations thing down as well making good deals people are not going to look at new ideas when they're struggling to feed their families so a country doing well economically is going to be a necessary precondition um, for talking about new ideas and um, you know bringing people out of that day-to-day -day grind whereas this is a very common communist thing where it's like people don't rebel against the power structure if they're starving and trying to grow potatoes you know um, and to bring a halt on, on, on immigration I mean one of the things that I've always said about immigration um, with, with the whole debate about it recently is people are like oh no they get jobs okay well if they get jobs then because of su supply and demand they are reducing the um, the pay of, of a lot of a lot of the wages of people in that country oh well they don't get jobs then well if they don't get jobs then they're on welfare so no matter which way you look at it um, without it being carefully planned and and um, and executed um, you know step at a time time to, assimilate. time to assimilate and bring value to the society open door immigration is going to make a country poorer I do not understand an argument that that's not going to happen in a voluntary society where there was no welfare I mean this is the thing with the libertarians yes they the go open, well the you know in a free society is, a, is another uh, area where libertarians const uh, constantly sort of arguing exactly but you have two major breaches of the non-aggression principle which is throwing borders around a country and redistributing heavily from the productive to the unproductive now the reason why these left libertarians are completely, completely and utterly silent on the welfare state um, effects of having open door immigration. I do not, I don't know why. Mm. And they just go, well, if we have open borders, like for me, the logical step to a freer country would be to reduce the parasitism within that country. And if nobody could, could take the wealth of other people, hide it in their own enclaves and form these non-assimilating groups. And the only reason they can do that is because they don't have to interact voluntarily with the native population. When you have welfare, you don't need to talk to or like or get to know or work for or with provide the people, value provide it. value yeah. to the people whose money you are getting. Yeah. So you can sit there and do your thing and that is completely not what we want to happen. So whilst in a free society from principle I understand the open borders argument but it cannot happen whilst the current uh, welfare state systems are in place. It just cannot. And the final point I'll make is there is a very big difference between having principles and then coming from those principles to a consequentialist position which you see as being in the service of those principles. So like I say, well, I have a principle of non-aggression, um, but for now, because the welfare state is so predatory, I will support a candidate who wants to halt or slow down this open door immigration policy. I still have these principles which I understand and can argue for, but in the current available options to me, I will take a consequentialist position. Um, people who take a consequentialist position with no principles, that's a completely different matter. And But what I think is happening now is the whole thing with the Trump thing is you're going, yeah, we have these principles, but it's about what's actually going to get us further towards these principles. If you yeah. say we should have open borders without then slowing down the systems of government growth and welfare predation, you are going completely in the opposite direction away from your principles. And to me, that just seems completely insane. Can I say something about the immigration thing? No. I, <laughs> sorry. I think, I think uh, everyone's, in, uh, everyone's sensitive to injustice to a certain degree, but it depends sort of like what, you're, what scale you're working at. Yeah. We, we are insensitive to the injustice, but we have this big, long timeline, big picture view. We're, in, we're sensitive to the injustice of... So we like, are insensitive or sensitive? Sorry, we're, we're sensitive mm. to the injustice. And we're sensitive to the injustice, the predation on future generations, which yeah. the tax you know, the taxes are, do, are doing and, yeah. you know, the unseen costs, right? The, the hidden costs, costs, which is the yeah. thing that you've always got to get with economics. And people who just see this, the superficial and the surface and the short term, they see like, yeah, people are suffering in the present here in these countries where the refugees are coming from. But 
the long term view is no one's going to be helped if we just invite everyone. Yeah, again. well, do you see that guy with the marbles? And he's like, look at immigration. You can take millions of people from the third world, and then the people in the third world don't improve their lot at all, and they have more children, and they pop, the, exp uh, the population increases exponentially. You're just consuming the wealth of the first world. It's just the basic communist thing. It's like you take from the rich, spread it around. Everyone's poor. Like it's not yeah. like everyone gets rich because people's behavior changes through time. Money is not a static resource. It is a it is an economy of money coming in and going out. So and, and people respond to the incentives. So as soon as exactly. you set up some government program to help some segment of the population, those people will adapt to take advantage of that. You know, exactly. Sort of what, what, what do you subsidize growth? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, you're right. I mean, it's almost like a greater good kind of thing. I mean, we sound like communists, but <laughs> in the real sense, it is yeah. the greater good. But yeah. the rational, actual, rational, actual yeah. greater good. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, Tim. <laughs> uh, and Trump, another area which Trump is really good on is uh, energy policy. I mean, he's dismantling the, the climate uh, change industry, which will um, drastically reduce energy prices. Right. If in the United States, we could learn a lot from, from that in Australia. Uh, and also, he's, oh, yeah. he's probably the most... Uh, like, he's not a complete non-interventionist, but he's definitely the most non-interventionist president America's had for, for quite a while. I mean, uh, you know, making, trying to get along with Russia, I mean, that's a very good thing. Uh, and obviously yeah. uh, not, mm. not trying to rebuild uh, Middle Eastern nations like uh, Bush did with Afghanistan and Iraq and Obama yeah. uh, tried to do with Libya and Syria. I mean, uh, that, that's a massive step forward as well. So he's focused on tending his own garden, and this is where we come back to the principle of individualism versus collectivism. The, the closer you can get to individuals as sovereign entities, the better off we are. And fair enough, we're heading towards this globalism now. Anything we can do to put a break on that and turn it around is better. So I've never considered myself a nationalist before, but... God, it's it's a way it's better. Necessary. Also, yeah, it's a necessary it's preferable alternative. To globalism, you know, right? Yeah, preferable to globalism, and it's a step in the right direction. So. But the thing is, I think for us, where we differ from some of the other people, uh, I guess people who would identify as like alt right, and I don't think any of us do. But um, what I'm seeing on the alt right is that they're taking um, the success of Donald Trump and they're going, okay, nationalism is the answer, and they're making that their end game. And they're actually they're, they're changing their ideals. Now, we're all... Nationalism without NAP. Like, well, we're happy to have national... Well, even government. so, but, I mean, they're, they're, they're ending, ending their ideals at, at this nationalist model. Yeah. And we're all anarcho-capitalists, ultimately, but, you know, we recognise that um, that sort of utopia is, uh, at the very least, a long way away, if even possible. But these, that's the ideal we strive for, is this total sovereignty of the individual... And, um, and we go, okay, where we're at in the world now and in politics, nationalism is what we need right now. But once we're comfortable and strong in nationalism, let's, let's shrink it further. Let's get f further down. Mm. But a lot of these alt-writers are just going, boom, nationalism, that's what we need and that's the end game. Ethnostates and, and ethnic Ethnos, nationalism yeah, as yeah, well, yeah, which, which is not... Which, yeah, is a whole... whole you know, but thing. once again, if, if such a state came about as a, the voluntary choice of people then fine. I mean, if people feel like self-segregating along whatever line, I don't have a problem with it, as long as it's voluntary. Yeah, but a state can never exist a voluntary on a totally voluntary level. No, it can't, no. Yeah. But, I mean, it can be small. Yeah. Well, that's it. We shrink it until it's, until it's individual. But, I mean, sovereignty. the other thing, too, about the immigration, too, uh, with these open-border libertarians, Trump came along with the policy of saying, well, for every immigrant that you resettle in an expensive Western country where they can't compete culturally, they can't compete economically. You know, there was, a, there was a thing I saw just today that in Australia, it was a government survey of resettling in Australia, 90% of them are on welfare, 90%. And there was something, similar statistics in Europe, 90% of them are just sitting on welfare. Um, so they can't compete in expensive countries, but Trump came along and said, well, for the same amount of money, we can actually help 13 times the amount of people by resettling them in safe zones in Middle Eastern countries where they share the language, closer to the language, they share close to the same culture, they share the same religion, it's the same people and they can construct a, more, um, construct a life there because it's the same culture. Yeah. So even if you say, well, I support open borders because I want to help people, Trump's blown that argument out of the, out of the water by saying, well, you'll help 13 times 
the amount of refugees with the same money by resettling them in the Middle East, where they're ultimately, I believe, going to be happier um, rather than just jamming them like a wedge into foreign cultures where they can't compete and don't even want to compete. You know, they, they're still quite proud of where they come from. So, I mean, if they stay there, then the leftists don't get to congratulate themselves. <laughs> but but we're talking about left libertarians. And once again, I think I'm highly skeptical of how libertarian these people would actually be if, if ruled on principle. Yeah. Yeah, I think certainly tr uh, Trump's uh, f foreign policy and also his uh, uh, domestic policy uh, with regards to immigration is definitely going to lead to a more stable world than we would have under a Clinton presidency. For sure. I, I think so. It's a necessary step. I mean, he's not he's not a libertarian. No, that's and none for of sure, us ever said he was. Yeah. No, but he's right now a step in the right direction. And like I said, people think that if you take a step in the right direction, you're abandoning your principles. But like I said, there's a difference between yes, saying, I'm going to make this step with no principle and saying, well, I have principles and in the service of those principles, I'm going to do what I can right now. Yeah. yeah. He's not a libertarian, but at least he's a capitalist and he recognizes that yeah. there's no such thing as a free lunch, you know, and <laughs> yeah. yeah, things, things cost money. So yeah, yeah, he's a businessman. And how much of libertarian is about, uh, libertarianism is about free market and the property rights philosophy and yeah. property rights and stuff. So at least he gets that. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely I think that in the era of Trump, libertarians should be should be optimistic rather rather than some are uh, uh, are wallowing in despair. I I I'm I'm certainly pleased with the progress of the Trump administration so far. So far, so good. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah. I mean, even too with just uh, a bit blatant thing is Hillary's um, agitating Russia. Yeah. Mm. You know, I mean, that was scary. Even if that if we don't go to war to Russia. We, Go to war with Russia, that's a huge bonus. Mm. Now, uh, let's uh, talk about a controversy you guys were involved in, uh, which was an Australia Day video you did what with a few uh, <laughs> other, other YouTubers. Now, that video has since been removed. Um, during that, you just uh, you talked about race and intelligence. You, you copped some backlash for it. So, sort of, uh, can you describe what that experience was like and sort of what you've taken from it? Yeah, well, look, um, you know, we've we've uh, spent the last couple of weeks dwelling on it and, you know, examining closely um, the topic. Um, and I've even since made another video on the topic of um, racial IQ patterns and race realism, as they call it. Um, I, I had um, that guy T on our show and talked to him about it. Um, the crux of it was that um, it's a highly sensitive and volatile topic. And... Um, it's, it's not something you ever discuss out in the open um, at the moment, you know, and I think really if we can move back towards a, a, a free speech model of society, we'll be able to discuss all of these things out in the open. But it's a really taboo topic and um, we hear about it and read about it and talk about it within our own circles, but we don't, we've never really broached the topic outside of it. And people from outside of our circle of thought um, got a hold of the video, they um, they didn't, um, well, we were pretty blasé in the way we talked about it and a bit insensitive uh, to, to people that are affected by, um, you know, the reality of the racial situations in Australia and other countries. And, uh, and basically, um, we, we, we copped a lot of backlash from, from our own community and from like our, our work communities and, uh, and from people on the left. And, you know, um, the truth is we didn't really make any hard and fast declarations about what this stuff means or even what the point of it is. So that's why we decided um, that the original Australia Day video we made wasn't actually of much value. It wasn't actually that good a video and that these topics do need to be discussed, but we need to do it in a tactful and sensitive way. Um, you know, not in a feelsy deny um, empirical reality way, but in a way where we can include people who are sensitive to these topics or who have never heard of these topics before, and we can make a make a you know principled case um, surrounding them. And and to be honest, uh, it was a bit of a shake up for all of us uh, in our day to day lives um, to receive that much hatred and vitriol from people. Uh, it certainly um, made us aware of the uh, the character of some people that um, you know we we weren't aware of before. But it, it also, most importantly and most usefully, highlighted to us where we have been going wrong in our conversations and how we can have a more 
uh, positive impacts on the world and on people who aren't already in our echo chamber, you know, a way to reach more people with these ideas by just changing the way we talk about them without ignoring the empirical realities. And yeah, I mean, obviously with that video, one of the criticisms, which I think is very valid, I mean, from people that support what we do, is we didn't have a point. Yeah. Um, you know, it's easy for us to say that people know where we're coming from, but the thing is, uh, we had they less. Know, we tell them. <laughs> yeah, we had less viewers than we do now, and uh, I think a lot of people don't know where we're coming from. And you know, it's very unfortunate the way leftists have been race baiting people into absolute hysteria. Um, and if anything, you know, we would want to broach these these topics. A lot of people want to broach these topics to calm down this race baiting and it's a reaction to the leftists being obsessed obsessed beyond principle with race mm. and so we would talk about that but when people don't know where we're coming from it looks like we're talking about it for other reasons or for you know we didn't define our reasons we didn't define any conclusions um but we since have we since have you know, and uh yeah we're, we're pretty, pretty for that reason it was quite a low quality video which is very yeah. off the cuff and we didn't really have a point and that's why it seemed um, a bit kind of uh, self-indulgent, I, yeah. I guess, in a way, like with no point. It was just sort of making fun of things that are maybe not very fun things to sort of yeah. talk about. So it, because of being also a very low-quality discussion, we decided to take it down. Yeah, and we're, we're going to continue the conversations. We just try to try to have them at a, at a high level of... Um, reason and evidence and, and also, you know, bear in mind um, that, you know, like you, you talked about the sort of anti-SJW approach to libertarianism and, and these sort of YouTube conversations and ultimately we, we came back to the drawing board and we thought, well, we want to bring more people over to these ideas. We want to convince people who are um, resistant or unconvinced and if we do it tactlessly, if we do it um, in a mocking way, um, or if we do it insensitively, then we're less likely to achieve that goal. So yeah, it's just about balancing, uh, balancing our goals while talking about things realistically. Yeah, I, I think it's all uh, well and good to yeah discuss controversial uh, subjects, but yeah, certainly I th I think that uh, even though like people like us, you know, we don't mind triggering and offending people, there is where there is times when when it can just be some things that are said that are just unproductive and, and not yeah. helpful you definitely can go too far and we offended a, a couple of people who um you know in the scheme of things in terms of their character and their principle are really really good people like really um working hard and really you know fighting for good things in their lives and we we upset some people who we have great respect for uh, we've since talked to a lot of them and, and, you know, met up with them and really tried to um, communicate our ideas in a better way. Um, and really, that's what we should have done in the first place. And, and we're going to try to do that more. Because, yeah, we never never wanted to hurt anyone, obviously, and that's not our goal at all. Mm -hmm. um, and what probably wasn't apparent in that video, too, is it is unfortunate that people in the, say, the alt-right sort of thing are taking these topics in a new direction, which we didn't want to do as well. And we probably didn't, um, you know, put a line in the sand. We were saying, well, if anything, we would delve into these topics so that we can steer them more towards principle of yeah. individualism and voluntarism, you know. But unfortunately, and we didn't even really know this at the time, there are a lot of people who are taking them away from principles of individualism and voluntarism. And so, you know, that our... That, our that's sort why of, this race realism stuff is a, is a dangerous topic because it's divisive in, in a lot of different ways, no matter yeah. how you cut it. Um, but I guess to make it really clear is our position is, you know, like data and, and statistics and empirical reality are worth knowing, they're worth viewing and they're worth talking about. But uh, we always come back to the principle of individualism. And as Ayn Rand put it, you know, uh, no statistical um, data set about any group or collective will ever tell you anything about an individual and we are individualists. So um, while these are these, uh, this race realism stuff is empirically valid, or, or so, so the data seems to as say, we, as we know, um, the, it's, it's philosophically invalid, and I don't think it is a productive conversation at this time.
Yeah, well, you've you've learned from the experience, which uh, which is the main thing, and yeah, uh, I mean that that's the the lesson from all of this. Look, we've we've run out of time now, so thank you guys for being uh, guests on on today's show. Thanks well, for having us, Tim. Thank you. Thank you. And hopefully we'll cross paths again in the in the future sometime. No We'd doubt. love to, yeah. Maybe we'll uh, we'll get you on. Uh, we'll. Uh, Turn the tables and interview you next time. Oh yeah, I'd, def I'd definitely be be happy for that. Well, you've done a lot of interesting things, so we'd love to get into those next time. Awesome. All right, everybody, that's the show. So I'll be back next week for another review show. Uh, don't forget to, if you haven't already, sign up to our email list at theunshackled.net slash subscribe. Don't forget to check out the support section of our website. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on SoundCloud, iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, or view the video version on YouTube. Don't forget to keep visiting theunshackled.net for all the latest news. Uh, thanks once again for listening, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.